but last Sunday was Pentecost. So we're taking a pause from Nehemiah and we're looking at Pentecost. And we saw that the Pentecost fire, it was not a destructive fire, but it's not a safe fire. It's a dangerous fire, especially to those who want to keep the system as it is. For it gave power to those who thought they were powerless. And it gave voice to those who thought they were voiceless. And these people went out into the streets. We're talking about our ancestors in faith, like Peter and the 120. They went out into the street. And we say he preached, but the more historically correct analogy is he a protested. They went out into the street. It was a holy festival. The, the holy people had gathered. It was a great day in the city. And it was a day when the city had to put its best, you know, face like, Holy people have come in a holy festival, and here it is, people coming out and saying, You have killed Jesus, who was innocent, and it disrupted the gathering, stopped the flow of traffic of donkey, and people were listening. What? It's a fire. In its own way, a fire of protest. They said, Say the name. The name that people want to silence. And they all, the leaders, they justified the killing by saying he was a blasphemer. He was a rebel. But here's the disciples say, no, we want to tell you the whole truth about who this man was. A man appointed by God. And so I want to continue that. So what happens to this Pentecost protest? These people go out in the streets and the people hear the truth, they call the people to repent, and people change, they want to come, and they want to change their lives, and they begin this community, and Luke describes what this Pentecost community is like. And that's what we want to look at together this morning. So, Acts, and you know, you probably know this passage well, and I pray but the Holy Spirit would uh, open our eyes and see this story in a new and powerful way. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 to 47. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. And this is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I think it is interesting that Luke tells us in this description of the community, he goes into talk about the community before anything else. What stands out about this movement is about is this community and their life together. Right. The message is important and we hear about disciples and what the message was, yes. But it's this community that made the message believable. Something happened in this community that made Peter's claim of the resurrection of Jesus believable and that people would join. And so he focuses on the community. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of living. Something has sparked a new beginning in this people. And that's what I want to look at. The fire comes down, and what does it create? And the first thing we see is that right from the very beginning, this community is a diverse community. The, the, the gift uh, and the miracle of speaking in tongues, right? It's about how every one of them that are gathered there are understanding the same message in their own language. The miracle is that of diversity. And the, and the amazing thing about this is that these uh, Jews, who, the diaspora Jews, who had gone out and perhaps were born in other lands, with other cultures and other languages, they were coming into Jerusalem, most likely practicing Hebrew, because that's what the, the gathering at the Jerusalem was all about. 
You guys go out there, you learn different languages, but don't forget your mother's tongue, right? So you come and we're gonna celebrate it in, in the center of Jerusalem, in the temple, and we're gonna read scripture in Hebrew. And so I imagine these people, they're brushing up in Hebrew as they're traveling. And then when they come, rather than hearing in a, what might be to them an artificial language, because it's not the language of their heart, suddenly they begin to hear the message in their own language, in Greek, in Persian in Korean, in Spanish, in English. Right from the start, as the church is birthed by the fire of the Holy Spirit, it says, this is about diversity. It is not about just one single language and one single culture. And everyone has to try to kind of assimilate into it. One way of doing things, one way of preaching, one way of talking, one way of theology. No, it is your diversity in your, the language that you, you grew up with, the language that you dream with, right? The words that move you to tears and you, just, you don't start understanding, you feel it first. That's the language, that's the word in which the good word, the gospel will be communicated. Diversity is the first thing about this, right? In contrast to what was happening in the Pentecost, where it was trying to be more uniform. Get, you know, get in line, speak and talk in this language. Diversity. Now, uh, the church, I think we, we un inherently understand this, and to a great extent, I think we do a good part of it. In fact, uh, many of the uh, languages that was oral becomes written was because of what church's mission work did. They would often go, and rather than trying to teach the language, of the church to them first, they will try to listen, these mission workers, they will listen to the language and they'll try to translate it to written. And they want to translate to written because they want to put the scripture in their own languages. And so in many ways, the church will be the first person, first people who will make a dictionary for that language. And the, and the first written words of many of the tribal languages were the scripture. And it's a beautiful thing. So we have that DNA in us, diversity. Let people speak their own language. Let people come with their own food. But we have this other opposite uh, tendency where we try to enforce still a single language. So there was a time where in the American churches where they felt that King James Version was the only acceptable scripture. Now King James English wasn't even the language that the apostles spoke, right? But still, that was it. That was the holy version. And there was a time when the church said, the Latin Vulgate, the Latin language, this is the only holy version of the Bible. Don't speak. But again, even the disciples didn't speak Latin. And the scholars say, well, we've got to go back to the original language. We've got to go to the Greek to understand what Jesus said. But Jesus probably preached in Aramaic. So even what we say is the original language itself was a translation of the words of Jesus. You see, in the church, there's no such thing as this one single, most authentic, holy language thinking. The message goes in the languages of our hearts. Diversity. That's a mark of the Pentecost church. Right? A church that is on fire for God. Diversity. Another thing we see here is this. Inclusivity. We hear that the people have always gathered together at the temple, mm -hmm. but also at their homes to break bread. Mm -hmm. Now, homes, you don't invite just anyone to your home. You, you invite people to homes because you have completely accepted the other person. You are saying, from now on, you're my family and I'm your family. Now. And we might dismiss this and say, well, you know, that culture, pre-modern days, they had much more hospitable community. But in those days, hierarchy was a lot more rigid than us. You have to be careful who you invite to home. You don't want to fall in your hierarchy. And also, association matters a lot. Who you invite, you associate with. So even when Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house, everybody was talking about it. Oh, so does that mean that Jesus is condoning this tax collector who ripping off his own people? 
citizens association. But here we have the church that inviting people to their homes and saying, we are family and we accept you as you are. And, and, and that's what inclusivity is. Because we can have diversity, but sometimes diversity can be a photo op. It's a way for us to make us feel good. Or maybe it's a way for us to... Okay. I'm glad you say it, right? It's like, I did my part. I did this, so I don't have to invite you to my home. So I work at the Presbyterian Mission Agency, and uh, you know, that means, like, I gotta be honest about our church, right? We, so we do a great job of diversity at the national level, and we have some national conferences, and we do all that. But the thing is, the thing is, when we come down to local congregation, most of our local congregation is still segregated. And it happened because there was decisions made in our church history where they said, sorry, we're gonna leave our neighborhood, the neighborhood because it's becoming too unlike us. And so we're segregated. So we have great policy statements about equality and diversity, but yet we don't have inclusivity. Because we're not, we're not fellowshipping at home. I mean, I'll be honest. Like, um, so I was, you know, back in North Carolina, I was doing ministry. I, I grew up in a Korean church, and I only imagined myself doing Korean ministry. But really, God blew that open. It was really God. Uh, Korean American English ministry started, and non Korean started coming in, and, and God continued to, you know, take away my blinders, go back to Scripture. And their real friendship developed. And, and one time I just had dinner with an African American who was at that point now the elder of our church. And they were reading. And you know, he said to me, you know, you're the first uh, Asian to eat at my home. And you know, I, and I'm the first, just the first time I've even gone to a home of an African American. It, it means even to like to age 30, as much as I you know, the, did the work or, or praised the work of justice, I never even had an intimate relationship that I could be at home with people who were not like me. I bet there are a lot of people who lived their entire life and they would never have one person or family of another race or culture at their home. I think it's important that Luke points out that they went to the temple, but they also broke bread at home. When you break bread, it means you're sharing, you're completely not tied together. What makes you happy makes me happy, and what makes you cry makes me cry. What is your problem is my problem now. Right, so Paul, like, when he talks about the gospel in the book of Romans, right, he sums it up by saying Christ accepted Jews, so accept one another. And the way we practice it is rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Because you're one now. Whatever happens to your siblings happens to you. That is your destiny. We don't see that. The society doesn't want to do that. And that's why we have a lot of, lot of places, right? American cities, Korean cities, wherever, a lot of segregated cities. So, because we don't want people to know that the destiny is tied together. Because when people recognize that, then they will rise up together. But here's a church that recognizes it. And they remember it by breaking bread together. We'll be breaking bread together later to recognize that we're a family, our destiny is shared. The third thing we see is equity. They uh, sold so that no one would be in need. Now, most people would follow with diversity, that well, diversity, hands clap, right? Inclusivity, we should seek for it. Equity, where like it impacts my uh, pocket. Whoa, hold on there now. That is difficult. Difficult for me, for sure. But here's a church that, uh, that made sure that no one was in need. They created a whole different economic system for their community. 
You know, and when we're talking about economics, when we're talking about money, what we're really talking about is power, right? Really, money is a currency of power. Whoever has money can dictate. And there are ways in which, again, we dismiss this. Um, one of the ways is, uh, well, one of the ways as a pastor, like, uh, we learn about is, like, well, this time, these Christians, well, they, they, they had a very, very different context, which is true. And they, um, they believed that Jesus was going to come back real soon. So they felt like everything now was going to lose value anyway. Right? The, you know, the end of the world, <laughs> it's going to lose value anyway. Elbow Schweitzer was a brilliant theologian and, and a mission worker. And he, he believed that these first one Christians were like, moved. And the ethics was based upon this, that imminent, imminent or immediate return of Christ. But as I read scripture, I don't think that was the driving force. I mean, it, read through the book of Acts, and when you know, Luke talks about this community, right, the main thing is not Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back, what are you going to do? Those houses are valueless. Don't buy a house, don't invest. It's not that. In fact, when the, the return of Jesus is ever mentioned, it's some, most, like, most of the time it's Paul saying, hey, 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 he hasn't returned yet. He will, but he hasn't returned yet. So uh, those people who could work, get on working. What, what drove or what grounded their ethics is not that Jesus is going to come back my generation. But it's the end of the world. But actually they believe the new world started with the resurrection. A whole new world started with the resurrection. And so they saw what they had in their hands differently. Their priorities changed. That's what drove them. And so in those pre-modern days where economics wanted on land, here we see that they sell land so that they could share the resources and so that no one would be in need. Another way we might dismiss this is, uh, you know, in, like, well, in those economic times, again, uh, context is different. The, the current economic uh, belief that upholds the way we do today nowadays in America is this, that whatever is in our hand, we got because of our effort. So, we deserve it. Right? You work hard and you earn. It's yours. But that type of understanding of economics is a, a historical economy. It doesn't take into consideration the context, the connection of all things. And when you look at history, we realize that uh, a lot of the capital wasn't through simply by just labor. It was through unjust stealing of labor. Right from the very beginning, it started with looking for free labor and when they couldn't get it from the natives, they went to the blacks and they justified a theology and they had a justifying uh, sociology to take all the capital belt by labor. So there is no, uh, no thing as a deserved resources. When, when I, uh, once I talked about this, like, can we be challenged? Like, I know the society is one thing, right? Trying to society. But at least in the church where we do have a common Lord and a common scripture, can we create our own economic system that is more reflective of the values of Jesus and the reality that he is risen from the dead? And one person laughed and said, no one's going to give up the possession. And I absolutely understand that person. I absolutely understand. Yeah, it's... it's, it's right. uh, Lesson Newbegin says this. Lesson Newbegin says, um, what is the only way to persuade a modern person about the reality of Jesus Christ? He says, you know, modern people, they have a, you know, a scientific worldview, right? Where, so the resurrection of Jesus, or rising from the dead, that... that it doesn't fit into their uh, scientific, physical reality, materialistic worldview. So what will convince them? And he says something interesting. He says, 
It's not going to be through another scientific argument. I mean, the resurrection itself claims that it's outside of our materialistic understanding. You can't explain it. But he says the only thing he believes that could be the hermeneutic or the way to persuade modern people is the church itself. Living by its claims. And you know what? This is exactly what happens in the book of Acts. Day by day, people gathered. They didn't gather because Peter brought this well, you know, thought out apologetics of how Jesus rose from the dead, from the biblical scripture uh, prophecies being fulfilled, and from their scientific understanding. It wasn't that, it was because they saw the community and, oh my goodness, what? These people? They really are willing to sell their land just so their siblings won't go hungry? If that could happen, then I'm sure Jesus, a person, could rise from the dead. That was their persuasion, their life together. What couldn't happen in the society happened in their community. I do wonder and imagine how the church would be if we would understand that we have the same shared destiny, that we believe in the same resurrected Jesus and we practice this diversity and this genuine acceptance and inclusivity and this equity where no one goes hungry. Clarence Jordan, um, he was a pastor in Atlanta. Uh, he created a community called Koinonia Farm, where he had, during the Jim Crow days, he had blacks and the whites, all the people together, accepting one another, and they could come and they would share their possessions. And the KKK went into their homes. See, so that, that community, like, they didn't even go out and protest against Jim Crow. They just lived a, a life where there was no Jim Crow, no segregation. And the KKK felt threatened by it, went into his house, and threatened his life. They said, we don't let the sun go down on people like you. I mean, like me, yeah, like you who fellowship with the non-whites. And he said to them, well, I am so glad to have met you because I've always wanted to meet someone who could stop the sun like Joshua. <laughs> For the moment, the tension eased, and the KKK people who there, who didn't laugh, went out, but they went, and they took, threatened all the businesses, and the businesses dried up, contracts dried up. There were days when they would go and they would just shoot, they blew up their farmer's market, and yet Clarence Jordan stood faithfully. Why? Because he believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And he was called to be the church. We are a Pentecost community. Amen.